Southern Journal for Contemporary History. Uh, we appreciate your support and hope that you enjoyed today's presentation by Dr. Kudakwashi Shitofiri, who will provide us with a historical analysis of illicit cannabis production uh, by the communities of the Mohotlong district of Lesotho. This is undoubtedly a fascinating topic, which I look forward to learning more about. And I think it's always nice to be exposed to research on Lesotho, as its history is so closely interconnected to that of the free state. Uh, while Dr. Shirdofira is not uh, a stranger to many of us present here today, I'll still provide a short introduction for those of you who do not know him. Uh, Dr. Shirdofiri completed his honors and master's degree at the Department of Economic History of the University of Zimbabwe and graduated with a PhD in African Studies from the International Studies Group of the University of the Free State. He has taught history at the University of Zimbabwe and at the National University of Lesotho. Uh, currently is also an African Humanities Program postdoctoral fellow and is a researcher uh, with the Rhodes University African Studies Center. Uh, Dr. Shirdo Firi has published uh, on various African uh, topics of African urban social movements, music and protests and other social themes. Um, the discussion for Dr. Shirdo Firi's well, paper is, is Dr. Yeah. Noel Ndumeya, another proud PhD graduate from the University of the Free States International Studies Group. Now, uh, Dr. Ndomea has lectured uh, at the Department of Historical Studies at the University of Lesotho and is currently a lecturer for Social Sciences at the Social and Economic Sciences Division of the University of the Witwatersrand. His research interests lie in uh, land and natural resource ownership, use and constantations in Southern Africa. So, as per usual, Dr. Shitofiri has 30 minutes to present and Dr. Ndomea has 10 minutes to discuss his paper. This leaves us with a 20 minute question and answer session, which I hope you will make use of uh, to uh, ask any uh, questions that you may have. So, without further ado, the floor is yours, Dr. Shitofiri. You are muted, Dr. Shitofiri. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Laszlo. Uh, I wanted to find out first from you whether um, you in, it is ideal for me to continue with the video. It won't interfere with my presentation or during my presentation, I, 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 I cut out the video. What, what uh, would be the procedure? Uh, please continue with the video. It's nice to see the presenter. Okay, uh, okay that's fine. Um, thanks very much, uh, Laszlo and uh, the history, the history department of the University of Free State and the Southern Journal for Contemporary uh, History for giving me this opportunity to present um, this topic. Uh, like uh, it is an experiment for me to really work on uh, outside of my comfort zone, the comfort zone here being Zimbabwe. Um, this is for me the second time I've, I've attempted to work on a topic that is outside of Zimbabwe after working on, uh, on, on um, xenophobia in South Africa. But even on that xenophobia topic, it uh, still here was connected to Zimbabwe because most of the, in, of the interviewees who responded to, for, the, for, the, for the paper were mostly Zimbabwean immigrants living in Johannesburg. So indeed, this is the first time that I'm actually completely moving away from my comfort zone. The only comfort I take, I take in this is that I spent at least four years in Lesotho so it, 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 it almost became a, a second home for me. And I, I, that is when I discovered a lot of um, research interests uh, and uh, Matekwan being one of them. Matekwan here, it's the Susutu word that means uh, cannabis or marijuana. They call it Matekwan, matekwan in Susutu. Uh, as my topic reads, Matekwan Kibupilo, Matekwani Kupupilo is a, is a Susutu saying that means cannabis is life. That statement in itself is a reflection of the central importance of cannabis production and sale, for that matter, to Basutu in the Sutu. And uh, so it is from that perspective that I, I, I intend to carry out, I intended to carry out a historical analysis of illicit cannabis production by the com communities of Mokotlong district of Lesotho. Now, what is important about this is that Mokotlo is part of, uh, of, of, of those districts that are in the highlands. 
Uh, it is somewhere around, I think the northeast, if I'm not mistaken, of Lesotho. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's mostly rugged terrain, very high up in the mountains and it's past population. And, 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 and it's a, it is one of those, it is one of the four districts that are actually regarded as the highlands of Lesotho. And uh, my focus on Mokotlo does not necessarily mean that it is the only district that is involved in cannabis production. No. Actually, I, 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 I got fascinated by many of the, of the interviewees that, I, I, that, that responded to this, who continue to indicate the fact that, you know what, Mkotlo is not the only, most of the Highlands districts produce uh, cannabis. But what is important for me about Mkotlo is the, it is the most rugged, and uh, as also indicated by most of the, of the producers of cannabis, it is one that provides much more intricate and uh, difficult to, far, to find ways of, of moving the cannabis from, South, from, from Lesotho into South Africa because of the nature of the terrain. So as I indicated earlier, my study um, examines the evolving historical, geopolitical, and economic context of illicit cannabis, cannab 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 cannabis production or cultivation in the marginalized islands of Lesotho. Um, Kotlong is one of the most impoverished districts of Lesotho, and the population has historically operated on the margins of the state of South Africa, and, uh, and as well as Lesotho, either as providers of cheap uh, cheap products or as suppliers of cheap labor, especially to the mines of South Africa. Uh, that is how, so my, my, my interest became one, the marginality of Mkotlo itself. And uh, from there, I started to, to question how people have survived. You can even sense the marginality of Mkotlo when you go to, to Lesotho how most Basotho refer to people from Mkotlong or from of, to the district of Mkotlong. It, it, they almost sound as if Mkotlong is the back of beyond. So it is that marginality that, that, that tickled my fancy and I decided to carry a study of this nature. Now, it is in that context then of illicit uh, 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 cannabis, pro cannabis production in the context of uh, of, uh, of, of this marginality that I intended to examine the role of the trade networks between Lesotho and South Africa, especially along the border, and how these uh, trade networks perpetuated the illegal cultivation of, cannab of cannabis. Uh, my aim was to consider the mountains of Lesotho as suppliers of cannabis to mainly the Houteng metropolitan area in South Africa and the implications of that trade to the Mokotlong district inhabitant state of marginalization. Um, what is interesting is that I, I, I don't know why I had, when I went to, my, to do my field work, I, had, I, I thought I, I was that narrow in terms of my focus. Mokotlong and uh, Houting, the metropolitan district, the, the province, only to find out that the networks are as wide as Eastern Cape, are as wide as Kwazulu Natal. So I, I, it was something that, and, and, and even in my analysis, it is something that I intend to, to change so that it becomes much wider because those networks are not narrowed to Houteng province alone. So historically, cannabis production in the highlands resulted in a reproduction of, the, of what I, I call asymmetrical relations between and inside the metropolitan and mountain areas of both countries. And this coalition of actors merged from these new relations that, that the cultivation produced. And as such, this, uh, this article should be analyzed as an assemblage in which three distinct scales of territorialities were clashing or cooperating with, with each other. The article argues that the irregular mountain, the irregular migrants from Lesotho to South Africa took advantage of the fluctuations of their legal status as they moved between South Africa as they moved between, between South Africa and Lesotho, and the fluidity of the movement across the mountainous borders to the migrants and smugglers to, tra and smugglers to traffic cannabis, uh, cannabis across Lesotho into South Africa. Uh, I posite that life in single sex, male compounds at remote mining locations and urban townships in South Africa created a demand for substances such as alcohol and cannabis. And this demand 
agent cannabis cultivation in Oslo. In essence, I make a very, very bold claim that cannabis production was one of the key ways in which the borderland communities of Mkotlo and even beyond, and, and even beyond Mkotlo into other districts like uh, Akuting and, and, uh, and Kachasnek uh, dealt with the economic and social marginalization. Um, one of the key ways in which I intend to look at this paper, which I'm still doing, is that I, 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 I argue that rural livelihood strategies that engaged in, that engage in criminalized activities and hidden economies are important, but yet these communities are, are understudied, to say the least. Uh, so as such, this article examines the historical role and importance of cannabis cultivation as a criminalized cash crop in Mkotlong district of Lesotho. And I tried to employ some kind of multi-strategy approach that combined qualitative as well as quantitative methodologies. Um, and cannabis income, in, in which I found out that cannabis income was found to play a very important role in economic and livelihood diversification in Kotlo. Um, one of the positions that this paper also takes is that to understand the role and importance of cannabis production, we should view its production as an extra legal livelihood strategy rather than a criminal one. In that way, we can then better understand how its production is historically assisted rural smallholders who are not only economically marginalized, but further marginalized by drug control policies. In other words, I'm making a claim that most of the times when you look at um, marginalized communities who are involved in the production of such crops as cannabis, which is uh, illegal, which was, which is still illegal, uh, we tend to look from a criminal perspective, you know, to see the criminal mind, to see criminal activities. So my argument is that let's look at, at, at this from an extra legal livelihood strategy. And from then we'll be able to see uh, how communities benefit, especially those communities which are economically marginalized and, 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 uh, and also marginalized by drug control policies. Um, from, I, I don't want to bore you with too much of a historical overview of cannabis production in Southern Africa, but I'll try to be as brief as possible, just to give a, a, a historical overview of cannabis production. Uh, and what I try to do is to try and divide this into different phases. Um, and the first phase, which involves the small scale cultivation of, culti of cannabis, to meet the needs of customs and rituals that saw tribal elders smoking cannabis, but apparently in moderation. And some of the scholars who write about this are Makubane, Detroit, and also the, the second stage, which is the transition, which is when cannabis was first cultivated as a cash crop. Um, and for this stage is, is much more difficult to identify and varies from region to region. And um, one of the way, key ways that is the one that I identified in the in my introduction when, when I talk about life in the single sex um, male compounds and this provided the market for most of this cannabis that was provided that was produced as a cash crop. Um, so in the second stage production was was principally concerned with meeting demand in the region and especially within South Africa where alcohol and cannabis where the principal substances are available due to the very limited supply and high cost of imported drugs, such as heroin and, and cocaine. The third phase, you know, identified in the early 1990s and it coincided with the fall of the apartheid regime in South Africa, as well as what has been a gradual decay of a formal migrant labor system. Uh, and we see this, this stage sees the reestablishment of legitimate trade within and outside of the region and consequently greatly facilitated the development of South Africa and the region as an international hub in drug trafficking. So South Africa has that important role of being the hub. It, is, it has got a very fluid uh, you know, uh, uh, um, network, transportation and everything. And so it becomes the, the regional hub of the drug trafficking network. And the fourth, which I don't really focus on, but uh, which I identify all the same, is the most recent phase where we see the gradual legalization of the cultivation of, of, of cannabis in the region. 
And what is important is that Lesotho becomes the first country in Africa to legalize the cultivation of cannabis uh, for medicinal and scientific purposes. So in the main, you find that research that engages specifically with community, communities growing cannabis in the region remains very sparse. And the way it does, okay, is often quite been very superficial. You know, Eswatini is looked at also, and it has become the kingdom of, which was known as the kingdom of Swaziland. It's a significant grower of and supply to South Africa in the international markets. Um, and we also, and Lesotho then also becoming part of that, uh, of that, uh, of that uh, equation. So that's about what I try to, to give you as a background to, you know, to be, as a historical overview of, uh, of, uh, of, of mostly cannabis supply trade networks. But uh, I also move beyond just making an analysis of, of a historical analysis overview of cannabis and try to, to, to uh, create a much more clear connection which I call the South African connection. What is the connection here? Before I actually move into the into the area where we I, I intend to look at, um, at, at but before I, I, I develop that South African connection, I want to highlight something that is important. An idea that has been developed in the literature on cannabis uh, is the transnationalization of criminal networks. Why am I highlighting that? Because it is an, it is important when we are looking at South Africa. Uh, sorry, at, at, at Lesotho. Uh, where in, in South Africa, in Lesotho, cannabis smugglers, were, some scholars have argued that cannabis smugglers in South Africa and Lesotho uh, were recruited, were, recruit, were recruit, recruiting communities to grow cannabis. Looking at them in that context, therefore, means that rather than local communities identifying a viable livelihood strategy, it may have been proposed and encouraged by outsiders, particularly syndicates of drug traders. Such control by syndicates would potentially affect price, price negotiations and the bargaining power of communities, both within South Africa and Lesotho. Uh, if we go by that kind of analysis, viewing uh, drug, sorry, cannabis production and, and trade as being perpetuated and initiated by um, um, smugglers who use uh, locals to, for, the, for that production, it therefore also talks about uh, local official collusion in the trade. And that is very key, especially when it comes to Lesotho. There is a lot about uh, collusion, local collusion, uh, official collusion by the police and by, by the army. And I will talk about that much in much more detail later where I also look at uh, the involvement of the police and the army in the trade networks, in the control, in the regulation, in the monitoring as well as in the punishment uh, of uh, cannabis producers. Um, this is important to consider, especially in the context of Lesotho, uh, which has continued to experience weak governance and troubling undercurrency of political conflict and domestic violence. So uh, but South Africa's dominant position in the region as a financial and trade hub uh, functions for both the illicit, for both the illicit and illicit trade networks, uh, and South Africa uh, has become the major importer of the cannabis that is produced in the region, especially from Swaziland and Lesotho. Uh, but as, as a historian, I'm much more tempted to go back and try to see what is the. Is there any fixation with South Africa with cannabis? What is the connection? Is there a historical connection in South Africa and cannabis? And from then you find that, from my research, I found out that the first, the word cannabis first appears in writing in 1658 in the journal of Jan van Riebeck, uh, who was the commander of the Cape of Good Hope, of Good, of Good Hope at the time. Uh, on, 29, on 21 June 1658, uh, one of the young members of, of, of the indigenous Khoi Khoi communities who acted as Van Riebeck's interpreter told Van Riebeck that, I will quote here, the Hankum, sorry, I, it's a very difficult word to pronounce, but I'm going to try. The Hankum Kua, this is a, 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 a part of the, it's a group which was part of the Khoi Khoi at the time, 
who lived further inland, cultivated the soil in which they grew dacha. They pronounce it as dacha then. They grew dacha, a dry herb with which the koi koi chew, which makes them drunk and which they highly esteem. These Hankuas Van Riebeck notes in his, uh, in his journal, make their living by keeping cattle and planting the valuable daka, which drags their brains just like opium. And that is why this tribe is so fond of it, close quote. But then thereafter, Daka, Daka cannabis continues to appear in the historical record. The Dutchman offered Dapa in 1668, for example, remarked that it affects the koi koi brains and makes them giddy. They behave like crazy and senseless people, performing all sorts of strange gestures and wonderful grimaces. This is a record in 1668 talking about uh, the Khoisan and, and their, their so-called love for, 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 for cannabis. Uh, you also find that during the first centuries of colonial settlement, can cannabis was a perfectly legal substance. It was legal, interestingly. You find eminent travelers and officials, farmers and even missionaries paid their servants and, gui and guides with dacha or cannabis. And or but sorry, my apologies. I will continue to inter to use the word dhaka and cannabis interchangeably here. Um, or but the drug for keto and services. A much more interesting, uh, you know, finding that I made was that you find that actually the missionaries at what is now called Griqua Town raised dhaka in their grew dhaka in their church gardens, and they traded this dhaka with the neighboring son or bushman. Uh, but however, things changed by the early 20th century. 1903, the Orange River colony passed the Dhaka Prohibition Act 43, whereby the sale of Dhaka became an offense. Use and possession remained legal, but in 1922, the Customs and Excise Amendment Act 35 prohibited in general the importation, conveyance, and sale and supply, as well as the use of and possession of Dhaka and other habit-forming drugs. With the promulgation of the Medical, Dental, and Pharmacy Act of 1928, the criminalization of Dhaka was complete. Moreover, it gave the magistrate courts extensive powers of punishment for any offenses under the said act. This was followed by the abuse of dependency producing substances and the Rehabilitation Centers Act 41 of 1971, which would not only, which would not only increase the punitive jurisdiction of the courts, but carried extremely harsh minimum sentences. So many scholars have tried to provide a reason for the criminalization of Dhaka in South Africa. And just out of interest, I, I intend to mention just a few here. Crampton, for example, argues that Dhaka demon, dem, dem, the demonization of Dhaka began at a time of increasing, of increasing racial discrimination and rising African nationalism. And for her, that was no coincidence. She concludes that criminalization of DACA was all part of digging deeper, a digger, sorry, digging a deeper ditch between South Africans of different backgrounds and cultures. And another scholar, Patterson, in his uh, very interesting dissertation, actually concludes that the colonial construction of personhood, which later provided the foundation for apartheid policy, also provided the foundation for the prohibition of, dark, of, of cannabis. And he further argues that fear, racism, and political ideology were all part of the brew. The conceit that Daga exaggerated innate, character, innate characters, character traits was intertwined with racial prejudice, bolstered by corrupted notions of Darwinism. As apartheid became more, more entrenched, the South African establishment became increasingly concerned that, that Dhaka fueled political discontent and protest. Thus, on a political note, it is also crucial to bear in mind that the motivations of politicians and security forces in enforcing laws on cannabis prohibition, a crop that clearly brings much income into rural communities who try to cope with the collapse of the, especially in the Sutu, to try and collapse with the collapse, to cope with the collapse of the former migrant labor system. Uh, and, and also the declining food crop yields and the fewer employment opportunities. Uh, in Lesotho, why, why would Lesotho be 
this good in terms if I'm using the word good sparing the word good here sparingly in the production of cannabis. Uh, the cultivation of cannabis in Lesotho can be attributed to a range of physical, social, economic, and political factors. And I'll try to highlight some of those factors here. Um, some, of this, some of these factors include the retrenchment of mine workers from South Africa and the soaring unemployment rates that resulted from this. So it means that this the cannabis production became the alternative source of cash need uh, for the for most of the Basutu, especially from the highlands. Another factor is also tighter border and work permit regulations for Basutu entering South Africa. This further reduced uh, the opportunities across the board. Uh, another factor, factor number three, is limited availability of agricultural land in the Sutu, which could also mean that people are turning to cannabis to increase their returns from the land. I will, you know, because cannabis, according to the people who grow it, is, it can grow anyway. It does not need, you know, well-prepared um, flat um, grounds where this can happen. It can grow anyway. So this is where this is one of the reasons why this sort of becomes so that, especially in the highlands, they can actually hide up the mountains and grow huge fields of cannabis. They don't need these well-prepared uh, fields like would require for maize, for example. So cannabis becomes a replacement, especially for those who lose land. The other factor is also the declining levels of soil fertility as a result of monocropping practices and overuse that may make the hardy cannabis plant a more suitable option. So cannabis is much more, it's, 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 it can adapt, it can, it can grow in these very difficult circumstances. Another factor is also the rising cost associated with the HIV epidemic. So there are many factors. However, for me, for, you know, one of the key issues that we should also talk about here in terms of uh, the move by Basutu to the production of cannabis is the land alienation. Um, Basutu now are known as mountain dwellers, but I'd, Historically, they used to grow on flat surfaces in the Free State in parts of the Free State Province, part of the Eastern Cape, which was Basutu land at the time. So when they were moved and crammed around these mountainous areas, which is now the Kingdom of Lesotho, uh, one of the options this was to, to grow uh, um, cannabis as a cash crop because their traditional cash crops could not grow adequately in these mountain areas that they found themselves in after their land had been alienated from them. Um, Stephen Gill, in his book, A, a Short History of Lesotho, uh, alludes to the important role that cannabis played during the period of Sotho settlement in present day Lesotho. Uh, and again, he, he makes that connection between the sun and the ancestors and how the sun also used to trade cannabis with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Basutu. And as such, he argues that the Basutu were actually introduced to cannabis by the sun communities around Lesotho. Um, and he also talks about the gradual expansion of the Sotho and their mixed economy of, crash, of crop farming, heading and hunting over the past three or four centuries. However, because of reduced, because reduced, because land, this reduced the land, available to the sun, while some Sotho clans apparently employed methods such as intermarriage to forge alliances with the sun, other clans such as the Quena have passed down oral traditions which display a rather patronizing and colonial mentality of how they bought sun land for a supply of Dhaka. This is a quotation that I got from Gil. Um, so as such, such an occurrence would point not only to the cultivation of cannabis, but also to the existence of trade networks in cannabis as having been present for the past two or three centuries at least. So the trade networks that I'm talking about here are not, are not, are not, um, are not uh, current. They've been historically present and Gil traces them back to two or three centuries back. So one of the, but however, during this research, I found that you know, to try and, and account for a, a correct record of these trade networks, 
is very difficult because of the scarcity of the available sources, uh, especially the ones that talk about cannabis. Um, I also want to have a, to create a, co a political connection between uh, cannabis production in in, in, the, in, uh, in, uh, in Lesotho. The political connection of cannabis, the, the BCP party, the Basuto Land Congress Party, uh, had a very interesting slogan. I will try to read it here, and I, I hope I will be able to pronounce it in, in, in Sesotho. Uh, it, it reads, Akutla Naha Lama Tokwane Ayena. What it means is that the land is coming back together with its cannabis. It was actually one of the slogans of the BCP party, which was one of the of, 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 uh, very, among, amongst the first political parties in this, or black political parties in the suit, which had a slogan which actually alluded to cannabis production. Now, one of my, of my interviewees claimed to have very important data and connections between the BCP and cannabis. He argues that uh, the BCP actually at one time used to fund its activities from the money that it got from selling the sale of cannabis. And he also talks about the African National Congress as also being part of this trade network, that the African National Congress was also part of the trade networks and it also used to acquire um, cannabis from the mountain highlands and also trade it in order to fund its activities. Um, like I indicated to you before, now Lesotho becomes the first country to legalize the production of cannabis. And we have a very interesting character who is the director of a company called Medi Kingdom Holdings. This company grows and tests cannabis for medicinal purposes. His argument is that cannabis is crucial to the country's, to Lesotho's economic growth. Uh, let me just give you a brief of, of how this guy describes himself. I'm, I'm avoiding to mention his name here for obvious reasons. He describes himself as a high school dropout uh, who, because of poverty in his family in Kachasnek, which is one of the districts, uh, which, was to, which is totally rural and mountainous, he started smuggling cannabis from Lesotho to neighboring countries, especially South Africa, between 1989 until 2013. I'm quoting him directly here. My life as a youth and as an adult is always circulated around cannabis. I know there is a life in cannabis. I live in Kachasnek, and since I was young, uh, Matekwan, which is the Susutu name for cannabis, was the only crop that my family and the entire village where I live planted in large quantities. This is so because one can plant Matekwane anyway, either on a valley, on a flat topped terrain, or on top of a mountain, and one can still harvest bags of it. So this again supports the argument that I've been making about the, the, the suitability of cannabis in the rugged, in, of, of growing cannabis in the rugged terrain of, 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 of Lesotho as an alternative to, other, to the other cash crops, which do not grow well in such kind of climatic as well as uh, geographic conditions. So here he actually... It seems like we have lost Kula for a second, so uh, let's see if he can come back. Uh, Joylene, uh, do you perhaps know what happened? I'm not sure what's happening. Let me... Find out and call him. Okay. 
thank you. Sorry about that, Kura. Um, okay. Wait, 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 wait. Wrap up your presentation, okay, I was, I was, uh, I was not aware of what was going on. Let me just try to hurry through. How many minutes am I left? Hello. Okay. Can I continue? Can anybody? Can everybody hear? Can you hear me now, Laszlo? I can hear uh, you. You're already over by three minutes. I've been All sending right. you messages on the side, but it's okay if you can wrap up. All right. So. I could. Uh, you can wrap majority, up. I think you're left with less than five. Okay. A majority of 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 the interviews I carried out in this district, they highlight the central role of cannabis, uh, how it is assisted. Yeah, you can hear. Uh, we can hear. hear you. And we, we can see you clearly. How it has assisted them in in in, in alleviating their poverty situations, and uh, as such, they were willing to to risk the, to 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 risk uh, producing cannabis because it was the only option available to them at the time. Some claim that the first one of the interviews I, I asked I talked to claimed that the first fifty rand he held in his hand was when he sold a bag of cannabis. Uh, and the other one claimed that all the, for the all his siblings were sent to school as a, from, from cannabis production. So there is a very interesting uh, other areas where you talk where there's the involvement of uh, police officers and soldiers as smugglers uh, of, of cannabis. So he, in many of the interviews I, I, I had, the people indicated how they would carry 20 bags of cannabis to the border, and then so that because of out of the 20, they would then leave eight or 10 bags with the soldiers or the police, so that they would allow, they would give them safe passage into into South Africa, um, and they are also indications of the involvement historically of, of, of uh, senior army officials in the movement and control of cannabis production. Uh, so much so that uh, it, it has become a lucrative um, business for the political establishment back in, in Maseru, who continue to have these uh, legal connections between them and, and, and Mukotlo. So, Mukotlong becomes an important one. An important one of the issues that actually came up was how some of the cannabis that is produced in other districts, like Kacha Snake, like uh, Akuti, would be brought to to Mukotlong. Why? Because Mukotlong be, provides a much more intricate and difficult to monitor trade networks into South Africa. So that is how central Mukotlong district was in, is in the production and uh, illicit trade of cannabis. Um, one, of the, one of, my, of the people that I interviewed actually indicated to me that they did not choose this kind of business. Uh, but he argues that most of them had very sad stories uh, in their backgrounds. And one of the guys indicated um, a very recent pro project that is coming up as an example of how they end up being involved in cannabis production which is the construction of a dam, uh, the Podihadi Dam, which is one of the biggest dams in the Sutu. And he says, you find this Podihadi Dam, they just come and then they take our fields, which we use to grow maize, and we are not, we are only compensated with 50,000 malut, which is equivalent to 50,000 rands. And after a while, we won't, we won't, we, this 50,000 rands won't last, and we, and we are found, we are left with no fields that can adequately grow crops like, uh, like maize and others. The only option left for us then would be to go up the mountains and produce cannabis. So you find that, and then some also claim that they are producing cannabis. They have historically produced cannabis because it is the only business that their forefathers and their fathers have handed down to them. So it is an inheritance. And to stop the production of cannabis would be to let down the, 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 the whole family, because the whole family has historically depended on those fields and on the production of cannabis. 
But I'll, and and so the police and the soldiers sometimes send individuals, send send soldiers and army, the army to to Mkotlong district, to try and regulate uh, the the production of of, of cannabis. But uh, all they sometimes do is to claim money and and they are left uh, to if the other thing is that if you understand if you were the geography, the terrain in the city will may also give you an idea of just how difficult it may be to access some of the places where this cannabis is produced. So that in itself is an advantage to most of the cannabis producers because they do, do, they do it outside of the eye of the, of the officials, the officials here being the police. So you have a very intricate connection between these cannabis producers, the smugglers, the police and the army but however, when you are interviewing these people, there is a discomfort in terms of uh, talking about the, the involvement of the police and the soldiers. And you would understand that discomfort, especially if you uh, have experienced the heavy handedness of the army sometimes in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Lesotho. But however, cannabis production indeed, uh, now what Lesotho has done is to legalize the production of cannabis. However, this has not changed the situation for most of the cannabis producers in, in Mkotlo. Because, for example, at one time you needed to have 500,000 runs in order to uh, obtain a license to produce uh, cannabis. And most of these marginalized community members do not have that kind of money. So they rather, instead of becoming part of the legal community that is producing cannabis, they have continued to produce it illegally and they have continued to supply it uh, through their illicit trade networks into South Africa. I will leave most of my conversation for question and answer. Thank you very much, Lazlo. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Schnitofiro. Um, seeing that we are running uh, behind schedule, I'll uh, move straight to uh, Dr. Numea. Can you please, yeah, uh, perhaps shorten your uh, discussion of the paper to five minutes? Thank you. Okay, um, okay, Laszlo. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Tofi, for the for the presentation. And I think it is a paper that will contribute to our understanding of uh, uh, communities' resilience and, and agency. Uh, you also explained to us that not so much is about um, cannabis production in, in Southern Africa. So that would be a good uh, contribution. Um, about the landscape that you were talking about, that you talked about, uh, you might also need to give our readers some, some clue as to Lesotho landscape and population is like. Um, it's mountainous, yes, and you also know that um, uh, about the, um, a, a quarter of the population is concentrated along the western, the western lowlands, along the border of South African um, Free State and in and, and, and Eastern Cape. So uh, it it it, show, it it shows you a, a bit about. Um, the activities of the people in the highlands because that's the only area which is relatively sparsely populated because the mountainous areas or regions don't occupy, don't accommodate people as much as the lowlands uh, do. Um, so that would be another uh, issue that you might want to, to emphasize in the introductory stages. Uh, I wanted to ask about what um, what informed your choice of Mukotlong district. You did explain um, why you chose Mukotlong district, but um, looking at the amount of information and the stuff that you shared with us, I, I, would, li I would like to f have the feeling that uh, it would be more more interesting as a probably a national study. If it's not a national study, probably you 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 focus on, on on the whole highlands and the four or five districts in the highlands. Because a lot of the examples that you were talking about about BCP coming in, about uh, this guy who dropped out from school, about the army, 
it, it would speak to the whole of the um, uh, the highlands, you see. And and when I also looked um, listened to your your periodization, I was not so clear as to where where you study uh, starting from. And of course, it's ending around now when the marijuana is being um, legalized. But then if you go back as far as the Jan van Riebeck or the, the colonization of um, uh, the creation of Lesotho as a nation. So, so I also think, therefore, it wouldn't be enough then to focus on Nkotron alone. I think you would need to look at a bigger region which can show us dynamics a bigger dynamics or clearer dynamics over over time. Um, there is an issue of uh, marginalization. Yes, I think you explained to us what you mean by by marginalization, and I also I also like the way you um, um, defined marginalization in a much broader uh, perspective by also looking at um, the creation of Lesotho. Um, as a nation, as a nation state during the 1840s, 1850s, when most of the uh, land in present day free state was taken away, thereby forcing uh, Basutu today in the, in the, it's part of my marginalization because they are now in marginal lands and they, therefore they don't have as many alternatives, economic alternatives, except uh, growing uh, matequana or marijuana. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point worth noting about your do definition of marginalization. It's, it's broad. Um, something about the market, something about the market. There's, there's something very unique, which I think you should also um, emphasize on, on, on bring out that uh, South Africa is the economic hub of Southern Africa, or if not the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. And the, it exports a lot from industrial products to uh, consumer goods. If you go to the suit today, all the supermarkets, shop right, you can pay, the markets are selling products from the suit, so from South Africa, um, fruits, cooking oil, everything. So this is a very a very unique situation in which the the country which is pro predominantly a consumer of South African commodities is 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 is, is uh, exporting a product to South Africa because South Africa is the biggest big market for this marijuana. So I think it's something that I found if we might need to explore a bit on and show us those dynamics. Is it because South African um, leg legislation or laws are so st stringent not to allow local locals to produce marijuana for this lucrative market, so so that um, the product is coming from uh, from Lesotho, or is it because the Lesotho government or authorities are not doing enough to keep it? Or, or they are benefiting from it, so they are ignoring or paying. Um, they are not paying enough attention to 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 stop the the trade. So, I think it's a, it's an interesting dimension which 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 you can also emphasize on and 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 and, and, and look at. Then you also talked about issue of land scarcity. Yes, I understand about the uh, inadequate agricultural land in Lesotho and. And so matikwane is a bit more versatile crop which can be grown grown uh, all over different landscapes and different terrains. Explaining again why I thought, why I think you can expand your focus from Mkutrong to other other regions so, so that you, your points would come out very more clearly. Um, then, um, the, the agency, I like your point about state players, how the state officials are coming in as well, the soldiers, the police, and some of the politicians, what they are not doing and what they are doing 
uh, which uh, facilitates or promotes the the growth or the continued existence of the of this um, um, pro, uh, economic activity. Uh, you touched on commercial commercial uh, marijuana in the in the. Yeah, moving around Lesotho, the past six or so months, you find a lot of these uh, greenhouses mushrooming all over. And in, in, in initially, I used to think that uh, it was meant for um, vegetables. And some of most of them are meant for marijuana production. But then, isn't there no another form of marginalization here when the license then is five hundred thousand? I remember reading up. Something to do the one million to get a license to grow commercial marijuana. Don't you think there's marginalization within a, within another form of marginalization? Because obviously one million or five hundred thousand, not everybody would be able to to raise this money in order to get the the license to produce this uh, this 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 crop. Um, maybe that would also uh, link up with your your point about the role of state officials and then the link the linkages the links between the producers and um, the state and policy makers in coming up with um, such figures which might not promote um, production of the crop by many uh, many of the basutus uh, you then talked about the retrenchments of the uh, the retrenchments of Basutu from South African mines and how the um, people then migrated to the, went back to South Af to Lesotho and started marijuana production, um, stringent work, work permit regulations and, and so on and so on. Uh, you could also situate this within a certain uh, time frame. When when did these retrenchments? Uh, when are they so popular? And what is the effect on marijuana production? Can we identify a period when we have so much of marijuana production? Periods of decline over the over the uh, the years. Um, in short, that's my 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 observation. Those are my my comments. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Numea, uh, for your providing us with your valuable insight and observations on Dr. Tufiri's paper. So let us open up the floor to questions. There is already one question uh, in the comment box. Uh, please raise your hand uh, or type in your questions on the side. Uh, we'll take questions of three and uh, we'll see. So the first question is by uh, Madlozi. Uh, Moyo, who asked, thank you for your presentation, Kuda, I really enjoyed listening. Uh, would be interesting to know whether uh, Matekuane is indigenous to Southern Africa or not. It seems to me that it is not. Rather, it came from Arabia, India, before the arrival of the West in Southern Africa. Does this question affect the trajectory of your paper? So that is the first question. Um, are there any questions from the audience? If there is no questions from the audience so far, I do have a question uh, for you, Kula. Um, <clears throat> uh, how does small scale cannabis produce? How did small uh, scale cannabis producers uh, react to the uh, uh, legalization of cannabis production uh, by the Lesotho government? Uh, was it supported, or did they see it as a threat to their already sort of precarious livelihoods? So that's my question. Uh, are there any further questions from uh, members of the audience? Uh, please raise your hand. Uh, Lotti, yes. Hi, Laszlo. Thank you. Thank you, Kuda, for the paper. I was going on and off these network problems. I hope maybe you raised uh, some, maybe you could have raised some of these things. Um, you talk about. Uh, the production of uh, cannabis. Is it, is it an individual project or is it a family project? Was I see in Zim when these are produced or they are in the fields, 
there's the role of the men, the role of the women, and even the kids participate in terms of weeding. Uh, there's this division of labor in terms of, of production. Does it play out in, 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 in Lesotho? Then also, do we have, um, is it a seasonal crop? Do we have uh, droughts or it's, it's, it's a perfect yield every or throughout the year? Is it a seasonal crop? Does it suffer from slumps, the drought or other, uh, other factors? Thank you, Kuda and Lazo. Right, Kuda, let's take those three questions. Uh, no? Th thank you very much, Lazo. Thank you very much, uh, uh, No. Yes, you, most of the, of the, of the of the stuff that came from Norway were really, you know, interesting contributions that I, I, I agree to take in. Um, he, he, he talks about uh, um, what in, one of his questions was what informs my choice of Mkotlo. In the, you know, that's a very interesting question you asked there because initially when I even went for, for my field work, my choice of Mkotlo was, I have to admit, informed by my limited knowledge of of uh, of cannabis production in in Lesotho I don't know why I actually thought that it was only in Kotlong that we find this large scale cannabis production only when I went out to to do my field work then I was then informed but actually other districts uh, produce uh, cannabis as well but what is the difference between Kotlong and those other districts especially the highlands districts is that or almost all my informants continue to mention that Mkotlong is almost like, has almost become like the the, the nerve center of of, of uh, cannabis production, especially for the trade net for the African trade networks, where a, a majority of the cannabis that is produced in Kachasnek, in uh, in uh, in um, Tabatseka and the other districts is brought to Mkotlong for further uh, transportation to South Africa. Why? Because Mukotlong provides a much more difficult terrain to be monitored by the soldiers and the police. But in terms of production, yes, I agree with you. Production happens in, in, in almost all the highlands districts of South Africa. So, of Lesotho. So, I may really need to widen in terms of uh, my choice of 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 uh, of, um, of Mkotlong here and, and make it much more national. The only interesting thing is that Mkotlong becomes the nerve center of uh, of uh, cannabis production. Uh, periodization, you know, the historian in me continued to try and, and 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 find an answer to why, where is this cannabis coming from? Lesotho. What is the connection between Lesotho and and South Africa? So that's why I, I had to go back into history and to try and 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 and, and find and that connection. Um, which may also answer the second, the other question that was also asked by Dr. Moe by Mad Laws, uh, whether matekwan um, or cannabis is indigenous to, to, South, to Southern Africa. Actually, it is not indigenous to Southern Africa. Uh, cannabis was introduced, originated from Southern Asia at least a thousand years ago, and it was only introduced into South Af into Africa through Madagascar and, and Mozambique and eventually into South Africa and Lesotho. So it is not an indigenous crop to, to, to Africa. But uh, what is key is that in Southern Africa, at least, it seems like the first major users of cannabis were the Khoisan communities, who then introduced it to the other communities in the region. Um, Laszlo, how did small scale cannabis, how did, how did small scale canna, cannabis producers react to the legalization? They reacted with, with serious, in, in, they did not like what happened because all it did was to further alienate them. Because nobody, initially, Dr. Mdumea is correct that initially, actually, the price for having a, a cannabis produ producing license was actually 1 million rands. And so it actually introduced major, major international players into the Lesotho market of cannabis production, where a majority of these small-scale producers actually lost their fields, as they were part, either partnered with or they were bought out by a few runs by these um, major international companies, or some of them simply ignored and continued to produce, to supply for their illicit uh, networks. 
So it is not something that has not been welcome. Actually, what the government did was actually to invite some, it took about two individuals who were actually well known, who had been arrested for illegal cannabis production before. They took them to America for some symposia. Um, and um, where this guy was taught how to do commercial production of cannabis, medicinal cannabis and stuff. And when he came back, that these two individuals could not raise the one million required to start to, to get a license. And so they've continued. In, in fact, th these two individuals actually used that as an opportunity to advocate for small scale cannabis production on the radio, on TV, but by and large, they continued with their, the illegal trade and to continued use of their networks. And a lot, in, um, yes, this cannabis production is both families and individuals. Like I indicated in my presentation, some of these farms are actually family farms, from family fields, sorry, which are handed down from, from one generation to the other. So there is both family and individual production. And, and like you're indicating, there is also an element of, 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 because remember these guys have got to have networks. So there are some who are responsible for looking for the market, some who are responsible for the labor on the market. Um, yes, it's, it's, it is, it is some, it is in as much as there are major seasons that uh, cannabis is, is produced in, in the suit, but remember the highlands, one of the key, ish, key things about the highlands is the water. It has a lot of water. So it is, this cannabis is produced mostly all year round. I think those are the questions that uh, came my way. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any further questions? I think there's time for one or two more questions. Uh, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, PP Molosiwa, uh, you raised your hand. Can you please speak up? Um, thank, thank you, Chair. And thank you, uh, Judah, for the interesting paper. I just have a small question uh, related to colonialism. And there's been a lot of talks. Some people have written about it that uh, alcohol, European alcohol, played some role in the colonization of Africa somewhere. I don't know. I don't know whether it's the whole of Africa or not. So I ju I'm just wondering if uh, even people like um, the Dutch who came early in South Africa used it as some form of currency to uh, pay for services from the the question and so on, and the question trans, um, sort of um, um, so, sort of, sort of uh, spread uh, the use of cannabis in, in Southern Africa. Uh, would there be any sense that cannabis may have, may also have played a role in, in, in colonialism? Because you talked about issues of intoxication going crazy and so on and so on and uh, if people are intoxicated and uh, would there be evidence that uh, cannabis may have played a role uh, in the colonization of the, the subcontinent thank you Should all right I... seeing that there's no further questions i think that will be the last question and then we'll wrap up today's session um Thank you very much. Uh, actually, that's a very interesting question. But my answer to that is that cannabis, interestingly, was actually viewed in the opposite direction. One of the one of the key reasons why there was an advo why there was a lot of advocacy for the ban of cannabis, cannabis consumption was that it 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 it, uh, it, it became a source of 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 protein. Colonial officials claimed that uh, after consuming cannabis, uh, the African natives became indignant, became stubborn, and therefore it became, they were, it hardened them more. So actually, cannabis was not, was not seen as one of the crops that uh, weakened the, the, you know, you know uh, and therefore further aided the colonization of Africa. Actually, it was actually seen as anti-colonization because a lot of the, the, the accusations that came from the colonial officials was that most of the cannabis smokers would then be hardened and much more difficult to deal with. Uh, the other issue that you also raised was in terms of um, how this was distributed. The, the, 
how the Europeans became part of the network of distribution. Yes, indeed they did. Like I indicated in my presentation, we actually have missionary society, communities producing cannabis on their church gardens and selling it to the sun communities. So we do have that. But in terms of, 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 of it being seen in the same vein as alcohol is aiding the colonial process, it is actually seen in the opposite direction. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shirofiri, uh, for providing us with an overview of your research uh, and explaining some of your tentative findings uh, about the illicit cannabis production in Lesotho. Uh, we wish you all the best with your further research on this matter and look out for any publications that might come from it. Uh, please join us on the 24th of November for our last presentation of the year. Uh, by Laura Phillips, who will be presenting her paper titled Pensions and Platinum in the Provinces, Accumulation and the Making of a Black Capitalist Class in Limpopo. Uh, I wish you all a good afternoon and would like to thank you again uh, for attending. And uh, yeah, special thank you to Dr. Shitofiro for presenting. Uh, keep well. Thank you. Thank you very much.